Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning, Carsten. Thank you very much for the invitation and the honor to be a speaker uh, at today AI Summit. And I would like to introduce to you new technologies and further trends in the area of AIS, especially for the topic of small vessel tracking. So uh, first of all, I would like to show you two slides about the company. Um, as the, uh, the next slides will be about AAS as it was up to date and what is new in 2018. The question then is what are the new features and are the new features sensible? And uh, if you have new features, the question will come out what are the advantages of the new features and are there real applications for it? Also, at the end, I would like to show you some uh, two slides about the new trends in the technology of AIS. So I start with uh, the presentation, two slides about our company. Um, we, are located, we are located in the south of Germany. We have no sea there, but we have 616 breweries around. Uh, that's very important. Um, the big companies like Audi, BMW, they are also located in Bavaria, and Bavaria is a very strong state of Germany. Um, our company is very active, as Jürgen already said, in all kinds of VHF technology with the emphasis on AIS. And what we do is we do safety equipment based on AIS, we do commercial AIS, we do uh, diving equipment, we have equipped special forces with uh, VHF equipment, we do buoy tracking, tracking for small vessels, and also we supply different accessories all based on VHF or AIS. So I'm coming already uh, to the slide, what was AIS until the end of last year? And everybody of you might know that there are two different types of AIS existing. It is class A for the commercial vessels and it is class B for the non-commercial vessels, for the pleasure boats, for small fishing boats and uh, other applications. The difference between the two type of AIS transceivers is what you can see below. One transceiver, the transceiver type class A is a so-called self-organized transceiver and the class B transceivers are carrier sense transceivers. And as an explanation for you who might not be in that technology, I would like to explain how class B carrier sense works and how class A self-organized works. So imagine you are going to the audit and you have reverse, uh, reserved the hotel. So you go to the receptionist and you say to the receptionist, hey, good morning, I have reserved a room. And then the receptionist say, yeah, go to the floor, there are a lot of doors, a lot of rooms, and select a room by yourself. So you walk along the floor, you knock on the first door and somebody says, hey, occupied. So you continue, you go on, you, you knock on the second door, you try whether the room is available. Oh no, sorry, occupied. So you continue, go to the third door, you knock the door, nobody answers, this is your room, you enter in that room. And this is exactly how class B works. A class B carrier sense transmitter looks whether there is a transmission already in the network, and if there is no transmission, then this transmitter is allowed to transmit. It's like the floor with the rooms. If it is occupied, you do nothing, and if it is free, you can transmit. So this is the way our carrier sense transmitter works. A self-organized transmitter does it different. So you go to the receptionist, you say, hey, I have a reservation, and the receptionist says, yes, your room is 417. So this means you have a reservation for a room, and this is what class A does. It reserves a time slot for the transmission. 
And this is a big difference because if a reservation is made, it is obligationary that at that time the transmission will be done. So a class B carrier sense might be able to transmit, but it is not always, um, always let's say, sure that, he, that uh, the transmitter can transmit. So the difference between self-organized and class B is that the class A self-organized always has a time to transmit and a slot to transmit, and the class B must wait and watch whether he is allowed to transmit. And now the question is, what is new? New is now since uh, the beginning of last year that there's a new type of transmitters in between a class A and a class B carrier sense. The new type is also a class B, but it is also a self-organized transmitter. So for what kind of vessels are these transmitters the ideal equipment? So as you can see here, these are the commercial vessels for the class A SO. These are, let's say, semi-commercial vessels, fishing vessels, fishing fleets for which this is the ideal uh, equipment. And then you have still the class B CS, which is for pleasure boats. So here you can see what is the ideal application for the new class B SO. Fishermen, fishing fleets, authorities, but um, uh, equipment with priority for transmission at less cost, group communities. And now um, the details of uh, the features which are better, um, as a summary, you see on that slide, which is it has got a higher power of the radiated transmission of 5 watt in comparison of 2 watt as it was before for a standard class B due to the slot reservation. There are no telegrams lost as I explained it before. It has got a priority against the class B transceivers. It is also possible to transmit AIS SAT telegrams with the special message 27. Um, also, it is able to receive a differential GPS correction. And uh, the last but the best uh, feature, I believe, is that these units are able to receive maritime short messages like WhatsApp. I explain it on that page what is the uh, detail of the advantages. So if you have a higher transmission power, it is of course clear that these units can be seen at a longer distance off the coast. Also, it is clear that due to the slot reservation, there are no telegrams lost anymore. With class B carrier sense transmitters, it could happen that a room is occupied or a slot is occupied and then the telegram does not go through. With that type of transmitters, it is clear that there are no telegrams lost. Also, these type of transmitters, they have the same priority for the message as the Brick Brother Class A. A very important, a very important advantage is that uh, these type of transmitters, they transmit also a SAT message, which, uh, which is the message type 27, and therefore, these uh, transmissions can be seen from satellites. I already talked about the differential GPS correction. So up to now, the exactness of the position of an existing class B carrier sense was up to 10 meters in the average. With the differential GPS, the position can be as exact as one meter. And now the best one, in my opinion, is that messages can be sent uh, between the units or between the units and the coast station, like with WhatsApp, to a dedicated transceiver or to a group of transceivers. And here you see how it looks like. So you have the regional center and the base station, and the base station can transmit 
to a class B SO transceiver, a dedicated message. And these units, they have Bluetooth and there is an app. And uh, uh, the result of the transmission will be shown at your smartphone as a WhatsApp. And it is bidirectional, so you can also transmit a message back to the coast station. And so you have a fully communication means at a class B transceiver. And it is not only that the message can be sent to one transceiver. So the base station can, of course, send messages to a group of transceivers. Uh, as an example, you have a small village with uh, 50 fishers. They all have this type of transceivers. And the base station notes that there is a storm coming out. So they can inform everybody by a message from the base station to the transceiver and from the transceiver to the smartphone that, should, that everybody should come back because a storm is coming up. This is a really big, big advantage in comparison to, to what we have today for small fishers, for fishing groups, for um, uh, closed user groups. How does it look like? I, I said to you, uh, the transceivers, they have a Bluetooth, they have a Bluetooth feature. They have a Bluetooth feature, and uh, this is just a screenshot of the Bluetooth feature. It's like a WhatsApp, and now I'm already at my summary. So the AIS becomes now a real communication means also for small fishing vessels, for small groups. Um, the new Class B SOTDMA technology is an ideal technology to communicate for semi-professional applications. The ideal supplement uh, to it would be the add of a module for subcommunication, especially if you use this kind of devices at high seas. And there are already units existing, of course, which uh, do the mix between the AIS capability and the SAT capability, which are called dual mode units. And these will have a big advantage in the future because they have the communication means um, at the coast, between coast station and the unit itself, and offshore with satellite. So I'm at the end uh, at the presentation, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd uh, uh, appreciate if, if you only ask a very specific question to this topic, and perhaps I'm asking the first one, um, because we'll, we'll have this uh, uh, more intense round l later on the podium. Um, Alfred, uh, how, how about the deployment of this technology? How far has it has been rolled out? What are the numbers in the market? <laughs> Um, of this class BSO technology. Actually, there are three manufacturers existing doing this kind of equipment. It is very, very new. Um, there was up to now not really sold um, interesting figures of that technology of set transmitters. But this will come in the future. The class BSO will be the product for the future. Thank you very much. Is there any immediate burning question? No, no, not not limited. Yeah. Ah, now, now uh, I thought you uh, your question is limited to quantity of receivers. No, it is limited. Uh, it is limited by sixty um, sixty um, Zeichen, sixty characters. Para thank you. <laughs> Talker. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, um, I, th I think for technology reasons or the sequence, uh, it seems that Torko's presentation is net. That's nice. So <laughs> you apologize us for sitting back here as well, because uh, otherwise we would have to turn around all the time. So over to you, Torko. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Good morning. And uh, to Carsten, thank you for inviting me here to present uh, something that I have worked on for quite a while. Um, 
At uh, FFI, uh, the Norwegian Defence Research Establishment, we, uh, we started a feasibility study for satellite AIS in 2005, I think it was. And uh, we uh, were the prime contractors for the AIS Sat 1 and 2, launched in 2010 and 2014. Uh, the Norwegian Space Centre has taken over the contractual responsibility for the satellites in uh, summer 2017. Uh, two new satellites, NORSAT-1 and NORSAT-2, with uh, the new generation of uh, satellite uh, or space AIS uh, receiver technology was launched. And uh, I will so show some results of uh, those uh, new satellites compared to the old ones. Uh, I will also talk a little bit about the performance of satellite AIS systems and uh, briefly mention the VDES, which is the new VHF uh, data system for uh, vessels, uh, now being implemented in, uh, in the terrestrial or uh, the ground segment, uh, ships and base stations, and being experimented in uh, uh, the satellite links. Uh, so, first, uh, briefly about the satellites. Uh, these are uh, the four satellites that uh, the Norwegian government uh, operate uh, for uh, their uh, applications and needs, coast administration, uh, coast guard, customs, and so on. And uh, the two new ones are those to uh, the right, and uh, the difference between the old ones that had one antenna, let's say the beam that points to the left, is that both the new ones, they have the new receivers, they have multiple antennas so that you can receive signals with two different uh, rotations, and uh, uh, they receive four AIS uh, channels at the same time. Actually, the receiver can receive five or six channels, and uh, operationally we use four at the present. Uh, Norway also uh, has a receiver, FFI has a receiver on the, on the International Space Station, and uh, it has been very useful both for uh, experimentation with the hardware, uh, new versions of, uh, of the demodulator, as well as for uh, applications uh, development and uh, demonstrations to uh, users. So, uh, briefly about the satellite. It is a small satellite, 17 kilos, from uh, Utahis Space Flight Laboratory, Canada. Maximum power of 60 watts. In, uh, in this uh, configuration, it, uh, it, the main mission is uh, the AIS uh, receiver and to contribute to, to maritime monitoring. But it also is two scientific instruments on board, uh, Langmuir probes from the University of Oslo and uh, a sun research uh, instrument from uh, Switzerland. Um, it is the, the AIS payload that, ha that has the priority in operations and also uh, the satellite is made uh, with uh, the two AIS antennas as uh, the primary design drivers. It's not that difficult uh, to put two, two uh, of these measuring band antennas that wrap out and uh, then you have them at a 90 degrees angle. So if the signal does not, is not received by the one antenna, it is received by the other one. And we will look at how uh, much that means to, uh, to the performance. Uh, the sensitivity of the receiver is minus 126 uh, dBm for a packet rate of, uh, of 20%, and uh, the design lifetime is uh, seven and a half years. Uh, the receiver is developed on an ESA contract and uh, will also be launched on the ESA satellite eSail I believe it will be launched next year. Uh, so, uh, to show some results, uh, on the left-hand side you see uh, the graphics of uh, the satellite, and uh, then you see uh, in the first column map and uh, ship positions in the North Sea. So it's Norway up, uh, up here, and it is Germany... Okay, a little to the left there. Uh, so, Great Britain here. And with uh, the AIS Sat 1, the old satellite, it was almost impossible to receive a message because of uh, uh, the interference and uh, the co channel, the co channel interference of AIS itself, as well as uh, terrestrial interference, uh, ground based use of the AIS frequencies. So, with a more sensitive receiver, we see how uh, the, AI, the, the NOR SAT-1 uh, can 
uh, receive messages and uh, the color scale shows how many observations, so that means how many satellite passes uh, a day was uh, messages received. And uh, if we combine all the satellites, the two old ones don't contribute very much, so it is the two new ones that makes it possible now to track ships with even more than 10 observations a day in the North Sea. And uh, in the Mediterranean, it was not that difficult earlier, it was difficult, yes. Uh, it got better, and uh, now it is an operational uh, possibility to track ships. Um, I have, uh, together with uh, colleagues from uh, European Commission Joint Research Center, analyzed a lot of satellite AIS data from the Indian Ocean, and we published uh, a paper that uh, presents the methods as uh, well as the results on uh, two campaigns that were done for anti-piracy purposes. Uh, let's see here, okay. On, on this one, so here I come back to, uh, to this paper and show some examples of how different is the performance in, uh, in different areas. Uh, the reason I mention this, I can say that uh, the four Norwegian satellites receive four million messages a day from 60,000 ships. And that can be compared to other, uh, let's say, providers. We don't compete in the market, but this is what we provide to the Norwegian government. Um, but it doesn't say how good is the service. So that's why we go into the areas that are interesting for various uh, applications and users. Uh, in, the, in the research we did in the paper, it was anti-piracy in the Indian Ocean. Uh, here I show the North Sea, because we are in Hamburg, close to the North Sea. And uh, I show the Mediterranean, because that is, uh, has been a hot topic for Europe uh, for a long time. And uh, on the right-hand side, I also show the North Atlantic to show uh, a place where uh, satellite AIS works uh, quite nice. Uh, a very good uh, single environment, not so many message collisions. And the curves shown below, uh, the top one for the North Sea, the middle one for uh, Mediterranean, and, uh, and the lower one for uh, uh, the North Atlantic, uh, shows how how different uh, the distribution. And by distribution, it's, it is the longest time gap. You do tracking, how long is the ship uh, not moving on your screen? And that is something operational people would need to decide whether, okay, is this a ship in need, or is it someone that has turned off his uh, receiver, or uh, I mean uh, transponder, or, uh, or, or is it just normal? So if you then look at the curve and you see the 50%, the 70%, and the 90%, uh, you can consider, okay, 50% uh, in the Norwegian, uh, in the North Sea, 11 hours, or even more, 12, it's completely normal, yes? But if you see in, uh, in the North Atlantic with these four satellites, uh, more than 10 hours would be very unnormal. So uh, it is different levels where you should uh, put some uh, effort into investigating a ship. So briefly back to uh, the comparison of, uh, of uh, the first, or actually AIS at one carries the first generation satellite hardware, but the second generation uh, algorithm, because it has been updated in orbit. Uh, and comparing the number of messages uh, and uh, the number of ships detected for the two areas, the North Sea and uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, if we take the, the total numbers, uh, the bottom uh, row, 53 times as many messages in the North Sea with the new technology as with the old. And we see that the biggest improvement is due to receiving the message type 27, the long-range AIS message, it brings you up from, uh, if you look at the factor for a number of messages, from 3.7 to 53. And uh, the first step that is uh, due to, uh, to the improvement of the receiver, it is a factor of two. So I have a poster behind there also. Uh, those that would like to uh, know more about this or discuss, 
can come over there in the break. At the end, I would like to mention VDES, which is uh, the new VHF data exchange system for uh, maritime applications. And it is already approved for the ship-to-ship, ship-to-shore uh, part, whereas the ship-to-satellite, the satellite link that is needed to make the system a truly worldwide uh, seamless system, it is being experimented with that, and uh, the important decision to allocate the frequencies or not will be made in the radio uh, frequency uh, in the World Radio Conference in 2019. So now, important work is being done uh, in the first column there on the standardization, uh, in the middle column on uh, the development and uh, experimentation with uh, equipment, both satellite equipment and uh, receiver equipment. And on top there, we see uh, Norsat 2 with a Yagi antenna, 8 dB gain uh, towards uh, the area of interest. And in the area of interest is uh, a Coast Guard vessel that carries the receiver equipment. And uh, in the right-hand uh, panel, you see some, uh, some measurements of the actual received downlink power, uh, as well as the frequency. So uh, the receiver tracks uh, on the frequency, seen very well, even though uh, the amplitude of the received signal varies significantly. I also have a poster about that for those who want to, uh, to discuss more or ask questions. Thank you for now. Thank you very much, Tokel. We, we have two uh, electronic questions, if I may say yeah, so. I think we should do the questions in the round because they are for Alfred. So they are more for Alfred yeah. then. Okay. So then over to you, John. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice mm -hmm. to see you all here on the morning after the, the party the night before. I think this is, uh, this is my third AIS summit. And I always tend to present with a slightly fuzzy head for some reason. I'm, nothing has changed uh, this year. Um, so my background has been 35 years in the space-based uh, monitoring, you know, surveillance and monitoring business in the geospatial world. So I, I actually retired earlier this year, but I'm doing consultancy for a number of companies. And one of these companies is uh, a company called Capella Space from California. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is not specifically AIS, but it's, it's some new technology some new microsat technology and SAR imaging that I think will be very, very appropriate to the, uh, the maritime community. So, you know, we, we, those of you that here, were here yesterday, you know, heard uh, the, all, the, all the fishing guys talk about, you know, the problem with dark ships. You know, AIS is great, but it's only great when the ship is broadcasting. So what happens when you've got ships that aren't broadcasting? And, and traditionally, you know, trying to use space-based technology imaging systems to, to find those has worked in some cases, but the, the, there, there are a whole series of drawbacks. If you're trying to use optical imagery, you know, in the maritime domain, you've got, you know, the weather for a start, you know, very cloudy, very hazy, uh, very bad conditions, and it's very difficult to use optical imagery to, to identify vessels on the sea surface. Uh, you can use radar data, you know, but again, there are a f only a few radar satellites around. They're very complex systems, uh, very difficult to, to basically task and, and do things like that. So uh, it's, 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 it's a problem that still is, is waiting to be solved. So one solution that, that is, is being followed now by Capella, and it's, it's really following on from a lot of the, of, of the microsat revolution that we're seeing in the, in, in the optical world. So there are lots of companies out there, Planet, uh, Spire, putting, putting CubeSats up. Uh, with SAR, it's a little bit tricky because SAR is, is, is a, a powered system. Most of the optical satellites are just receiving radiation from the Earth's surface. SAR has to beam the radio signal down to get it back. So you have to have a slightly bigger capability. But what Capella are doing, uh, and the, the funding has now been confirmed, uh, that they're going to launch 38 microsatellites in uh, a global constellation. I'll show you that later. Um, each has a SAR capability on. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, the thing is, it's, it's guaranteed image capture. You know, the, the SAR, as most of you are aware, you know, can see through the clouds. It can see day and night. It can see through haze. It will produce an image. 
Admittedly, it's a SAR image, and again, that's some challenges that that raises itself. It's not, it's not an optical image that we're all used to looking at. It's a SAR image that needs to be processed. But you're going to get guaranteed imagery down to one meter resolution. And again, I'll talk a bit about the, the options on that later. But it's an hour refresh anywhere on the globe. So if you want to monitor somewhere on the globe every hour, you'll now be able to do that. So a massive step forward in, in the overall capability that's up there. Now, having the satellites is one thing. Uh, getting access to the data, being able to control the satellites is another. So there's an awful lot of effort going into how you access this data. It's not going to be, you know, I want to buy a, an image um, and download 10 gigabytes to my local processor. It's all going to be cloud-based. We're looking at, you know, having the ability for people to have machine learning in the cloud, being able to access the data extremely quickly. Because, again, it's, you know, having, having the ability to see the Earth's surface every hour is great, but if it takes you two hours to actually do the processing and get the result, then it's a bit of a waste. So we have to make that extremely quick. So there's a lot of effort going in. And one of the things I'd like to, to get feedback on, excuse me, maybe after this session, is, is, is feedback from people who want to be able to do this. So if you're we're looking for partners, basically, who want to use machine learning to, to access this sort of data. So uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, and by the way, every satellite will also have an AAS receiver on board. So that is another massive step forward. Now, this isn't, you know, uh, Capella saying they're going to get into the AAS business. Uh, the, it's a pretty crowded industry already, some, you know, very advanced companies up there. But if you imagine having AAS on board when you're also capturing imagery, the ability to, to correlate between the image and the AAS is going to be very useful. Um, and as you'll see later on, the the options on the type of image that can be captured. You can have a very broad area coverage uh, looking at the AIS. If you, see, if you find an object that isn't broadcasting AIS, the next satellite along can do a very high resolution shot of it. So using some of the technology to cue and tip, uh, as they say in the surveillance world, to, 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 to use the high resolution for surveillance uh, capabilities is, is going to be very, very useful indeed. So, you know, this is, this is how it's being done. Uh, those of you that are familiar with, with SAR already, the, the satellite on the left is, is TerraSAR. Uh, that's the sort of main Airbus uh, SAR satellite, you know, a huge, huge thing, uh, five metres tall, two and a half metres, you know, cost hundreds of millions, possibly up to the billions. Uh, you can see on the, if I can get this right, that one, uh, you know, human 1.7, well, if it was me, it'd probably be about 1.5, but... Uh, We'll go with that one. Um, and then this is the, the size of, the, uh, of the, the Capella satellite. So if you, I, I always do this in, in terms that people understand. So this is the size of a mini bar fridge. Now everybody knows what a mini bar fridge is in the hotel. You know, that's, that, that, that's the size of it. Uh, and there's some very advanced technology going in to allow uh, the new uh, antennae, again, unfolding. So again, it's way beyond me, all the, the technology that goes into it. But it is, it is very new. It's, it's not using traditional SAR technology. It is, it is, it's, it's actually you know, m using some brand new technology which will improve the imagery, which will improve the agility. And one of the things about this satellite is it is extremely agile. So well, all the satellites are agile. So it's not just you know, going around hoovering up whatever's below it or to one side. The satellite can be moved around. So if you think about monitoring pipelines, monitoring coastlines, the satellites will be able to do that. Um, one application you know, we've already been talking to people about is if you're monitoring you know, beaches where you know, uh, people are congregating to be smuggled over the Mediterranean, the fact that every hour you can monitor you know, 20, 30, 40 kilometres of beach to see where people are, you know, people are, are sort of you know, uh, accumulating, that, that'll really help in, in, in understanding what's going on in things like people smuggling. So it will change how we use radar imagery. So this one hopefully will, will that run. Yeah. So, again, we're talking about, uh, well, there's 38 satellites, but two of those are going to be proof of concept. So 36 in, I think, 12 planes. So, again, you can see just an example there. Uh, I mean, unlike AIS, the, you know, the AIS satellites, which have a footprint, they're omnidirectional, the satellite will obviously be, you know, taking images either in a strip mode. So if you want to take a strip of data up to 2,000 kilometers in length, you'll be able to do that. And, again, if you, if you think about what we said before, Imagine one satellite taking a very broad coverage, uh, being processed to identify you know, suspicious areas, and then follow-on satellites using their high-resolution capability to go in and, and take shots of, of those specific areas. It, it opens up a huge possibility in terms of the monitoring and, and surveillance capabilities. Um, 
In terms of imagery, the, the picture on the left, you know, that, that's off, off the web. That's, you know, your traditional SAR image uh, showing the vessels. Again, you know, SAR is, is a very speckly image because it is, it is a, a reflected image back. And, you know, the, the speckle itself contains useful information. Um, and again, you know, in the machine learning world, the, the raw data is what will probably be used to, to train and to, and to learn and to understand. Uh, the, the image on the left is a simulated SAR image, which... Um, Again, the, the, the agility of the satellite and the electronics allow you to really clean up the image. Now, I know in the SAR world, cleaning up the image is, oh, my God, you know, you're, you're losing some data. Uh, we're not, because the data will still be there. But for people who want to use this, you know, maybe in, in some visual interpretation capability, you know, you can see here, you can actually see the cars in the car park. The cars pick up trucks, and there's one here with a trailer on. You've got a pretty well-defined road here. So, you know, suddenly the SAR imagery becomes, you know, visually acceptable and, and able to be interpreted that way. So, again, we'll be looking at how people can use this, this, this better imagery in machine learning. So, again, I, I invite anybody who wants to talk to, you know, to Capella to come and, you know, give me the details. We want to talk to people to see how they, how they will use this in developing new applications. So, the, uh, the old holy grail, when's it going to happen? Well, the first launch of the first proof of concept is going to be uh, in the next uh, one or two months. Now, that will, will prove some of the, the, the new technologies of the satellite, so the agility and some of the ability to do this, this, this cleanup of imagery. No data will be available to anybody else for that. It's purely internal for testing. Uh, the second launch coming in, uh, I think, about April 2019, uh, and that will produce data. Uh, obviously, it's only one satellite, so the refresh won't be there, but it'll show the quality of data. Um, partners that have signed up will be able to access that and start you know, working on, on their algorithms. And then it's the, the plan for the first six uh, is for the first quarter of 2020. Now, those first six will still give you three hourly refresh, uh, so it's not down to the one hour. And then following on from that into 2021, that's when the other two launches will happen to get to the full 36 satellites. So 2021, we're really talking about having this, this fully operational. But again, it's going to be very useful, really, at the beginning of, of 2020. Again, subject to, uh, to what can be launched. So hopefully, as I say, you, you've got a feel now for, for what's coming on. Uh, we, we're, we are in the phase of, of gathering information from people because, you know, suddenly, if you're developing applications and you're, you're using traditional SAR, it's okay, I'll get, it, I'll get an image every few days and you know, it, it's going to be one image and, 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 and that's it. So we're looking for people who are, who are looking to explore high-frequency monitoring. You know, what will be useful to get data every three hours, six hours, maybe even one hour? You know, I think one hour we're talking tactical and operational usage probably in, in government levels. But, you know, guaranteed data every day so you can see change will be useful. And then the final thing, again, not massively appropriate, I don't think, for, for the maritime community, but... The, this data will, will be able to be used for interferometric SAR, which is where you're, you're actually measuring displacement of the surface, so for subsidence and things like that. So, for example, you know, the, the recent dam collapse in Laos, you know, that was, I think that was a soil dam, to be able to monitor that every you know, few days just to see if it's moving. And we're talking movement in the, millimet uh, the millimetric you know, amount. It's down to the wavelength of the, of the radar. You're going to be able to monitor not just what's happening on the Earth's surface, but the movement of the Earth's surface itself. So an awful lot of things that, uh, that are coming along. So hopefully that's got you all excited, and I'll be happy to talk to anybody later on uh, if they want to start being involved. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> if you'd like to join me up there. Right on the front, or the... Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I think we we got uh, um, very forward-looking uh, information, although sometimes based on uh, technology that has been around for many many years. And uh, but even so, there uh, you gave us an indication of two th uh, of things now just being launched. We heard about uh, a new uh, protocol available in 2019, or or being. Uh, uh, discussed in the uh, in the the working groups, and then we heard about uh, launches um, uh, to be done and and hopefully successful. Um, there were a few questions um, which I think primarily go to to Alfred first, and that was um, 
are our messages being encrypted? So if you could take this hand microphone. Yes, of course, uh, messages can be encrypted. It depends on the transmitter and on the receiver. And there are three types possible. AIS-128 is the existing encryption technology which is used and encryption is just uh, available since, since years. Mm -hmm. And there was another question. If I send uh, a message via this WhatsApp type um, application and the um, intended receiver is, is out of range, what happens then? No feedback. Okay, it's just lost. And you don't get any feedback? No, no, no feedback lost. Okay, yeah. So that's, uh, th that answers uh, audience uh, question. There was also uh, uh, a third question about what is, uh, what does SAR image mean? Oh, sorry, apologies. I should have explained this. Synthetic aperture radar. So uh, not to be confused with search and rescue. Uh, it's basically, if you remember the image uh, I showed of the satellite, there's a, with the antennae, the way that the data is processed, it, it creates a pseudo uh, antenna, which is actually, in theory, bigger than the, the physical antenna. So that's the synthetic aperture of the radar. But essentially, it's as you saw, the vessels of the ships, it creates an image based on a radar reflectance. And so you see, you, you, you create an image, but it's not optical. It's, it's based on reflectivity. Thank you. Um, Tokal, I have a question for you. Um, the... Uh, what sort of applications would you foresee with respect to what you've heard yesterday um, of the uh, satellites that you are launching? Uh, yes, you, you ask about uh, the VDES satellite component and uh, the applications foreseen for, uh, for VDESat are exactly the same as for VDES uh, as a ship-to-ship -ship, uh, ship uh, base station. So it means uh, from the IMO, the International Maritime Organization perspective, it is uh, their service portfolio, which covers uh, weather predictions, ice charts, uh, everything that has to do with uh, the safety of life at sea. And on the commercial side, it's open for uh, various sorts of applications that, uh, that transmit small uh, amounts of data. Uh, in machine-to-machine uh, -machine, uh, systems, for example, and, uh, and email. But it's not wideband, so you will not have uh, video. You, you may have newspapers, uh, but not uh, live uh, broadcasts. Thank you. Is there any, any question from the audience right now? Perhaps? Pierre, I come to you. <laughs> Hi. Um, so it's <coughs> it's not so much a question; it's more of, of a comment. Uh, there's a really exciting project called Planet. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, and the idea is to index or to to give an image of everywhere on the planet at 0.7 meter resolution, something like this. And the idea is to make the entire planet searchable um, for I don't know tracking deforestation or. You can do this for illegal fisheries. We heard of this yesterday. So I just wanted to make that comment. I think it's a, it's a really cool project, and it goes along the line of uh, having an, ima an image of everywhere on the planet at what meter resolution. So something you could do with it. Ma index it all, make it searchable for anything. Go. M may I ask back? Uh, are you talking about the company Planet, or is it a different project? And will they image the whole globe, including water, yes. all all oceans? Yes, that's, right. that's good. From from when? Um, so they already have a prototype out there. I think you can log on and and start searching. I don't know if all the oceans are covered yet, but definitely all the ports and the terrestrial waters. So. Um, but I think the frequency is only one image a day, so it's certainly nowhere near what you were describing earlier. Uh, and you can't use that to detect things that requires a bit higher frequencies, like illegal fishing <coughs> activities. But um, I'm sure they'll throw more satellites at the network and, and solve that. Um, yeah, Thank they've you. already done the coast. But, but I was going to mention there's also Bill Gates is funding 300 satellites that have video cameras on board. 
that are going to be covering the world here in about the next three years, 24-7, the entire world. And already the privacy people are getting very nervous about that. <laughs> uh, but uh, I wanted to expand a little bit on the SAR coverage and, wh and why, uh, why it's so useful. Uh, the Italian Coast Guard and the Italian Space Agency have combined to use satellite AIS and the Cosmos SkyMed SAR system uh, over the Mediterranean because when somebody dumps their, their ballast illegally, or when they dump it any, legally too, but, but especially they've, they've turned on the satellites to look in places where they knew people were dumping it, but they had no way to identify them, their, their, their ballast water, pumping their bilges, which is illegal in the Mediterranean. Um, uh, they were able to detect a great many people doing that. AIS gave them the name of the people that were doing that, and so they would actually phone ahead to the environmental protection people at the port that that ship was bound for and have them come on board and check the ship. And according to the Ita Italian Navy, uh, they've been able to cut pollution in the Mediterranean by 50% by combining satellite AIS and, uh, and SAR radars. Because a SAR radar, uh, when you pump your bilge, you, you kill the waves, the little capillary wave action on the mm -hmm. top because the oil smooths that out, and it looks like on a, on a radar or SAR radar pic image, looks like somebody's taken a black marker, and and drawn on the image. Mm -hmm. Just yeah, yeah th thanks, guy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's there's a whole whole you know series of, of new applications coming out, and I think it, it's fair to say that that no, one single source of data does not solve the problem. It's combining all the different sources that are out there: optical, radar, AIS, to to come up with a solution. So there is another Slido question. Uh, I think it goes to Alfred. Uh, question says, is your AS unit allow hop-to-hop -hop messages between ships? And I think that is that what you just yes, said. Yes, it is. Uri from DocTech, my friend from Israel. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to just say that I use the Planet.com app, and it's uh, quite neat. You can see currently, I think, anywhere around the world, uh, one image per day, but it's uh, yeah, it's very cool. Uh, I was hoping you can shed some light on the ca current capabilities to monitor water depth using satellites or SAR, if at all. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with, with water depth. Obviously, you can do wave height and the scatterometer for wind. I don't know if Guy or Torquil wants to comment. Should we leave it to Guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can also sing the answer, maybe. No, no. <laughs> uh, you, you, you finished your, st your no. statement right at the end. I'd already raised my hand. You can't do water depth, but you can do wave height uh, off a of SAR, and it's very useful to um, uh, to detect water. And also, there is an, a sensor on the. Um, on the Spire system that also does that same thing now. And Spire has a whole bunch of them, uh, and it's extremely useful. I think we're going to have a brief from Spire uh, later on today. I was going to say that okay. in terms of water depth, if you're talking about shallow waters around coasts, then if, as long as the water's clear, then I think the optical satellites can be used to sort of do some sort of depth <laughs> measurement on there. I, mean, I know Digital Globe are doing something like that for the littoral areas around, uh, around the, the world. But uh, once you get into deep water or, 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 you know, sort of uh, dirty water, then it's, it's, it's impossible then. Okay. So, so, so final question from, from our online system. Um, the question is, uh, or the, the, uh, what is the difference between AIS and VA, VHF data exchange? Maybe it's also for Alfred. Oh, talking. <laughs> yes, um, that is a very good question. And... Uh, let me give you some background. What happened in the maritime world was that AIS got very popular. People started using the application-specific messages to, uh, to send sort of SMS uh, between ships, and it loaded uh, the data link so much that the original intention of AIS, anti-collision, uh, was, uh, was degraded. And uh, then uh, the seafarers and uh, the regulation authorities uh, got together and they agreed that we reallocate some of the frequencies used for uh, VHF voice, this is ship talking, to uh, digital communication. So then it's no one talking to each other. 
anymore. Uh, they are just sending messages, like weather reports, like uh, digital data. And with VHF data exchange system, it has become a lot of more bandwidth available. So out of the AIS system with the 27 messages, they have taken these application specific messages and put them into new channels so they don't uh, hamper the safety of life at sea in the AIS anymore. And uh, they have also allocated even more bandwidth to, uh, to uh, digital communication up to 300 uh, kilobits uh, per second in uh, the terrestrial uh, applications. Whereas on the satellite link, uh, we are not talking about uh, hundreds of kilobits, more like tens of, uh, of kilobits, uh, but still running the same protocols. Okay. So I hope that uh, gives some uh, idea of that AIS is in VDES system, but the VDES system is also much more. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Carsten. we have one more question one more from Thorsten yeah. Busso. Dean VGL. Um, we are receiving both the, uh, the vessel tracker and the Norwegian satellite, and I understand the Norwegian satellites are redundant, so they are they are basically separate from the other exact earthing opcom stuff, right? Can't you just park one above Chinese Sea? Then uh, <laughs> we could <laughs> we could uh, resolve this area, right? Because at the moment it's basically uh, it's a Norwegian <laughs> own thing, and it doesn't really it's. It's worse than the, the the commercial stuff, so it doesn't really help us. It's just additional uh, data no, we are getting and having now in two big databases. It was, it was more a request, not a question, right? <laughs> you can bring it forward. It would help a lot. Yeah, uh, I'm not I'm not sure exactly what you ask, but uh, no, they, you, you take one of the you have, you have a, the, the IS and your the satellites you're talking about. They are of course are on top of the normal AS satellites, right? Mm -hmm. Well. Torsten, perhaps all, I can all the, suggest all the that AIS the satellites are in low Earth orbit, yeah. and uh, the nature of low Earth orbit is that you circulate the Earth every one and a half hour. Yeah. So was more a request, not a. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Perhaps we can we can take up this question again uh, in the in the subsequent uh, session because there we will also talk about the competition between the different um, systems around. Um, I have one very very last one, and then we have to close the session. Uh, I would briefly like to come back to the Earth and, and just hear one community example from, from Alfred about this new um, amended and enhanced uh, um, Class B technology. Um, what is it already being used for or planned to be used? So um, there, is, um, there is one installation in South Africa, a small village, and in that village we will have a flagship installation for these... Uh, um, uh, interchangeable um, messages between the vessels and the coast station. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to close the session and, and thank the uh, contributors uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.